यार कल हो जाता है हर बार ऐसे सीन है हम्म फाइनली चल रहा है प्रॉपर्टीज में चेक कर लेता हूँ ओके नो शूट ऑल लेट्स कंटिन्यू तो जहाँ कल रुके थे वहीं पे कंटिन्यू कर रहा हूँ क्योंकि भाई कल बहुत टायर्ड हो गया था I can actually increase the bounding box and keep it middle of the bounding box. So this can be centered and in the middle. It can also be at the floor. It can also be tied up to the ceiling. You also have some advanced settings. We will not get into this, but basically this is where you can add underlines, strike through, casing, bullet points, all of these things. So you can always explore them after the video. So now that our typography is done, we come to fills and strokes. So these are the two panels just below your fill. Now, once I selected this heading, you'd realize that of course I had the text panel, but then I also had the fill option where by default the color is white. So I can change the color in whatever way I want, and you will see all the changes being reflected in real time. I can also go ahead and add a gradient where I can select the second gradient and make it slightly gray, but nothing will happen because my alpha is zero. So you need to increase the alpha and probably make it gray, and then put the headings right here. So you will have like a nice shadow effect. This is like a pretty popular effect that a lot of designers use. If I click on this minus button, the fill will go away. So the text is there because there is no fill. I cannot see it. So I will have to click on plus again. And the best part about Figma is that you can have multiple layers within the fill. So you can say that I have a black opacity at 20%. I have white at 100%, and I have black at 20%. I can also have red, which is like a subtle red at maybe like 35%. So you can have multiple layers. just how we had styles for text you also have styles for your fill but we will not get into those right now but the point is that you will usually oscillate between fills strokes and selection colors now what do i mean by that firstly i told you that you can select any layer put any color or gradient or even an image you can put an image or video here as well i can put the color f type this thing here and put 100% opacity and toggle the visibility on and on Now I can also click plus for my stroke and then select a bright color or maybe let's do blue and then increase the stroke width and you can increase it to as much as you want looks pretty pretty bad so let's just have a color which is slightly less jarring now in my stroke you can see this option right here which says either center inside or outside now what do i mean by that if we keep a 2 pixel stroke right now the stroke is outside of my text but if i switch it to inside you'll see that now it is on the internal levels now this is not useful in text but this is very very useful when you're creating ui elements because in a lot of cases when you're creating a div let's just say i create a pop up like this and let's make this white okay and usually this is how pop ups look like you have like a rounded edge you have a stroke i'll take this eye dropper tool take the same color and make it slightly darker and make it at 3 pixels so this is my outline now notice what is happening the stroke is inside the bounding box because we're on the inside mode if i make it outside you'll see that the stroke is beyond the bounding box So if my stroke was 25 pixels long you can notice that I will now have extra space accommodating but if I keep it on the inside it will not hamper at all but see what happens once I keep it on inside the outer edge is curved but the inner edge is sharp to fix this you have to go from inside to center when that happens you will have the stroke come up very very pretty so you can probably get back to like 4 pixels i always keep it on inside because then i know what bounding box and what pixels i have so that is the best way that's the safest way but yes the last thing that we have to cover within fills and strokes are the selection colors so thing is this subtext right here you have this thing called dark ui mid for why is this saying this because this is a style so you remember you can actually tell figma that certain hex codes have a specific name If I click on this chain icon, I just have the color again. I will call this color as A5 because in design language, if you say A5, it means A5 into three. If I say F, that means F into six times because you have like six digits in a hex code. So I will take A5 A5. I will select all of this text and detach my color style and paste A5 A5 again. Now, if I want to change A5 everywhere, I will have to individually go. right individually select the fill 
But what if I select the frame and say that no matter where A5 is, I want to have changes over every A5. That is useful via selection colors. So inside selection colors, if I go to A5, A5 and change this radar, you would see that it is affecting every single A5 presence which is a huge time saver. And of course, once we get into the implementations and detail aspects of it, this will be really, really helpful. Because what happens is that sometimes you have 10 screens and in all 10 screens, you have like a similar item and you want to change the color of those 10 items in all these individual frames. So instead of selecting frames one by one, you can select all of those frames and use selection colors to make changes very quickly. Now, once you have worked so, so hard, you obviously need to export these screens, right? Or maybe export a poster or a JPEG. To do that, you have the very last setting called export. If you select on anything, you have your export options. If you don't see them, it's probably going to be in this mode. You have to click on plus and then you go here and you choose your resolution. So of course, 0.5x, 3x, 4x works, but then you also have 512w512h. This is basically width, 512 pixels of width, 512 pixels of height. You will not use them right now. It is always better to keep it at 2x. Then here you can add a suffix to the file name. If you don't want the suffix, completely okay. And here you can choose the format between PDF, PNG, JPEG, SVG. Now a very important thing is that when you're exporting icons or illustrations, always export SVGs. Because if you export in PNGs, your app size or your website size will increase and it will become very heavy to load. When you're exporting JPEGs in Figma, always export in 2x. Resolution has been covered in our old videos. So if you go through our 15 episode UX design course, uh, we have covered this around fifth or sixth episode. And sometimes if you create a file name, let's just say I will create this thing as called folder image one. If I add a slash in my naming, and then export it. If I were to download this with the slash convention, this is how the file will download. You'll have a zip file. If you open the zip file, the first word before the slash that becomes the folder name. And afterwards you have your image name. So it's just a way to, you know, organize your files. If you put double slashes, then it'll have a folder within a folder. I usually do not use slashes in my names. I always use a dash. So I don't really like the folder. Uh, segmentation anyway. What I usually recommend is that once you're ready to export, you literally just have to select all of your frames, run the sorter plugin, do batch renaming. And once you're done with your batch renaming, you can export it. Now the thing is, if you have edit access, then you'll see the entire design panel. But if you share this to a developer or somebody on a viewing access, then they only see this part, export. That is all that they will see. So yes, we have finished module number two, where we did beyond the basics of Figma. And now we come to module number three, where we do practical implementation. Just want to show you how these files look like in a real, real Figma project. Before we move ahead and see practical examples, I want to talk to you about Figma community, which is like this huge open source free community where you can find mockups, logos, icon packs, UI kits, everything is available for free. Now to access this, let's come back to my free plan. And on the bottom left corner, you have explore community. So when you go to explore community, you have too many things going on. And of course that's understandable. But if you go here and click UI kit, you will have filters where you can say that I just want the free stuff. So you can click on free and let me go back. Let's type that again, free or just type UI kit. You can go to the filter and say that I only want the free stuff. So I will click on free. And once you do that, you will have access to so many open source libraries that you can use in your own projects. In some cases, they are freebies as well. But the fun part is that if I say click on Apple, you remember I showed you some screens from the iOS. Those were like official screens and from the official Apple design system. So Apple, Google, all of these companies, they have their official Figma creators page. So if you click on creators, you can actually find Apple uh, with 21.1K followers. And if I click on Apple right here, you will see all the files and guidelines that they have released 
uh, you know, under their files. So they have files for the Vision OS, which is for the Apple Vision Pro. By the way, we have a very, very detailed course on designing apps for the Apple Vision Pro. If you haven't checked it out, please do that. And we have iOS 17 and all of these things. So all you have to do is you have to click on any of these files and open up in Figma. It will open up a new Figma file and then you can copy stuff and keep it within you, right? So it's pretty useful. So I have just gotten this free file from Untitled UI. I thought this is pretty, pretty useful. And this will give you a very practical idea of how design systems are built. So the thing is right now you're just focusing on Figma, but to be honest, when you're designing, before you design any app, you need like a proper system of colors. You know, you have primary color, secondary color, and all of these things have their own individual properties. So even if you look at this button system right here, look closely, this is nothing but rectangles and texts. But then once we move on with the episodes, today is just lecture number one. And I know that these are really, really long videos, but folks, when I had put out a community post, you people said that Ansh, you teach us industry level stuff. And that is why I have made these. Now, even after so much of effort, if you don't put in your own effort to finish this, then nobody can help you, right? And I will really, really appreciate if you can just share about this video within your friends on Instagram and on LinkedIn. It really, really matters to us because if you don't support these videos, who else will, right? So I just wanted to keep these files here. Just wanted to show you that, you know, later on in the course, we will actually understand how do you make these different states? Like when you have something which is like a drop down, what is the logic? What is the process behind these small, small details? right? Because what you see right now, it's a blend of many things. You need to understand UI design and components and auto layouts and typography and psychology. And we have also created such detailed videos on UX psychology. There's a UX masterclass that we had. Uh, there are so many videos where we discuss so many UX mental models. To be honest, they will really, really help you strengthen your understanding because we have already created a lot of free courses. So what I would recommend you is that once this video ends, watch our roadmap video. So we have like so many free playlists we have for spatial design, UX breakdown, so many things, right? But I would still recommend you to watch this video called roadmap video for UX design. Then we also have our 15 episode course, which teaches you the subject of UX design. So what I'm teaching in this course is the tool, but we also have a separate free course available in both Hindi and in English that teaches UX design all resources available for figma ui and ux and marketing inspiration will be shared in the description so you don't have to worry about it but folks i'm telling you if you follow our figma and 15 episode course it'll take at least six to eight months but it's going to be worth it absolutely it's going to be worth it you know that the salaries are rising and it's a very very upcoming field and we also have made two very detailed videos on writing your ux case studies so there are two parts to it so make sure you watch those as well and here is your homework for the next five days. Firstly, comment below what we should include in the next set of videos because I'm collecting all the feedback. I want to make sure that this one single course becomes the most powerful, the most valuable resource available on the internet when it comes to learning Figma. After this playlist, nothing should remain. Also, it's very important to understand folks that with time, a lot of AI features are going to come into Figma. So a lot of people say that, is this even worth the effort? I think it is because you need to do a lot of grunt work before you can just automate all of your efforts to AI. So we have created a very, very in-depth video called, uh, is UX over? The thumbnail says it's UX over. Will AI replace us? We, I have in detail discussed all of these questions as to how Figma will evolve, how so many of these things are going to be automated. But if you don't have hands-on experience, when you outsource things to AI, you will not be intelligent enough to check whether this is right or not, right? So you need to do this uh, by default. You have to go into the trenches and understand how this works. So comment below if you like this video. Uh, comment below if you want the next nine videos to be as detailed as this, or do you think that it's not worth it and it's, it's too long, we should keep it thoughts as superficial of how other YouTubers do it because it makes no sense for us to work so hard and uh, if it's not working for you guys, right? And please make sure you make detailed notes on Notion. I have created a free video on my YouTube channel where I teach you how I use Notion. It's a brilliant tool for learning and you know, just like in overall, just understanding how to document your learnings in the first place. You can go through that entire YouTube video and understand how can you document your learnings very, very easily on Notion because the thing is, we will be covering so many resources and so many ideas and so many concepts that if you don't document these, 
by the time you reach the 10th episode you will just get confused and try to play with constraints try to go to figma's documentation and see if you can you know play around download a ui kit see if you can you know sort of do some experiments and watch figma's getting started playlist so this playlist is supremely important i strongly strongly recommend you to start learning these things on your own of course we are also coming up with very detailed videos but you should not wait and document all of these things start putting it on linkedin and start designing in public people need to know that you are learning people need to sir ji hindi mein boliye uh happy hacking actually i'm watching bhai <laughs> main seekh raha hu dekh ke seekh raha hu it's not like ki main sikha raha hu main seekh raha hu dekh ke and one more thing uh main ye kahunga ki english bhi dheere dheere seekhiye because अगर आप ये सब का जॉब करते हैं वहाँ पे इंग्लिश मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट रहेगा सो so, इंग्लिश भी इम्पॉर्टेंट है ऐसा नहीं कि आप नहीं सीख पाओगे फिलहाल के लिए ये वाला वीडियो अभी ख़त्म हो चुका है ऑलमोस्ट अब नेक्स्ट वीडियो प्ले करने वाला हूँ एंड आई विश कि वहाँ पे हो हिंदी में वेल well, इसको ख़त्म करने दो और कितने मिनट है और तीन मिनट है ठीक है तीन मिनट सी यू ग्रो आई हैव ऑलवेज डॉक्यूमेंटेड एवरी थिंग दैट लर्न इट हैज ऑलवेज बिन ऑन लिंग नो मैटर वॉट आई एन ऑटो ले आउट up being in the mind and saying you can always come we go through the timeless so, okay ye wala khatam ho chuka hai and uh, like uh, yeah i think puri english mein hai yaar ye videos jo hindi mein hai wo iske baad wali videos hai is wale ko sirf english mein available hai to isko english mein hi karna padega but dikkat wo nahi hai ek bar hum seekh jaye uske baad hum shuru karenge hindi mein bhi main hindi mein bhi karta hu like uh, agar aapne purani videos dekhi hogi meri live stream pe तो वहाँ पे मैं हिंदी बोल रहा था हिंदी पे हम लोग डिज़ाइनिंग वगैरह करते हैं ये तो फिगमा है यू आई डिज़ाइन का तो यू आई डिज़ाइन का है ये बट हिंदी में भी हम करते हैं ऐसा नहीं कि हम सिर्फ इंग्लिश में जा रहे हैं हिंदी भी हमारा है अवेलेबल और तुमको समझ आता रहेगा लाइक अगर तुम देखते रहोगे तो ऐसे नहीं कि चीज़ें समझ नहीं आएंगी चीज़ें समझ नहीं आएंगी तो हम रिपीट करेंगे आप क्वेश्चन पूछ सकते हैं वहाँ पर मैं हमेशा रिपीट करता रहता हूँ ओके okay. तो वो वाले वीडियो ख़त्म हो गया था इसके बाद हमको चलना है ये वाले पे फ्रेम्स एंड ऑटो ले आउट आई थिंक वो फिगमा गाइड का था यार नहीं नहीं फ्रेम्स एंड ऑटो ले आउट ही था वो वाई नाउ अलोन व्हाट टेक्स्ट यू ऐड इट हैज टू बी फिक्स्ड बट ट्वेल्व दिस इज नहीं ये हमने देख लिया ये आई थिंक था वो वेलकम Another important thing here, it tells you that whether this. Oh, यार, अब मैं confused हो गया. <laughs> अभी हम जो देख रहे थे, वो ये वाला था या ये वाला था? Hmm. I think ये वाला था ना? नहीं. ये वाला था. Most Figma courses on there again. हाँ. I will. वाला था. उसके बाद ये. Welcome to the adding constraint articles that you will have to an icon. Extend this thing right here. see this if i were to select this message bubble right right they would never this thing right here this is an info box I think okay now box. this info box yeah, i'm confused box itself is also a frame and within the frame all the elements in f right they would never ever delete f they know that this is a qwerty keypad and this has to be in frames that is why they are not using auto layout so you need to be very, very more in depth videos on our latest learning platform called learnuiux.in now we will cover a lot in a second ab mere ko wo dekhni padegi kal maine kya dekha tha to kal ki jo live stream thi matlab abhi jo main dekh raha tha na us reason se main bhul gaya ki maine kal kya dekha tha <laughs> uske chakkar mein dekhna padega mere ko ki kal main dekh kya raha tha kya hum सेकेंड वाली देख रहे थे या फर्स्ट वाली देख रहे थे नाउ दिस नैफ बार विल कम इनसाइड अ स्क्रीन करेक्ट सो इफ आई प्रेस डिस्कस दिस पार्ट बिकॉज़ इन एपिसोड नंबर 3 कोर्स ऑन लर्निंग फिग्मा एंड वी हैव अपलोड वही चीज तो मैं वापस फर्स्ट वाला देखा क्योंकि मेरे को कुछ चीजें याद नहीं थी वापस हम चलते हैं उसी वाले पे ठीक है ऑटो ले आउट सेकेंड वाला हमने 40 सेकंड मतलब 40 मिनट्स देखा था आसपास 40 मिनट्स यहां पे आसपास देख लेते हैं as i extend my width you realize that the container will also change its size now if i select a vertical layout this is to using auto layout and we haven't yeah. covered those yet so let's come back to our basics 
वी अंडरस्टो अगर तुम लंबे समय तक रहते हो तो तुम देखोगे कि भाई कैसे हम जीरो से शुरू कर रहे हैं एंड जॉब लग लग जब तक जॉब ना लगे तब तक हम कैसे करेंगे मैं ऑलरेडी वीडियो एडिटिंग कर चुका हूँ मैं ऑलरेडी ग्राफिक डिज़ाइनिंग कर चुका हूँ उसके जॉब्स वगैरह भी कर चुका हूँ एंड अब यू आई यू एक्स नया चीज़ है जो कि शुरू करना है मेरे को तो इसलिए यू आई यू एक्स हम सीख रहे हैं लेट्स कंटिन्यू टूड दैट देर आर थ्री ले आउट्स दैर इज वर्टिकल देर इज हॉरिजोंटल एंड देर इज रैप एंड देन इफ आई वू एक्सटेंड दिस थिंग राइट हेयर यू हैव दिस ग्रिड ओके बाई डिफॉल्ट इट इज इन द सेंटर बट इफ आई क्लिक ऑन अलाइन टॉप सेंटर देन क्लिक मी गोज ऑन टॉप सिमिलरली यू कैन अलाइन इट टू एनी कॉर्नर यू वॉन्ट Now the fun part is that you will have this one more option that says horizontal gap in between items. Now it says horizontal gap because I've chosen horizontal layout. So if I were to increase this gap right here, can you notice how there's more space in the middle? But you would be wondering why is the auto layout width not expanding? Because I have selected fixed here. If I were to go here and click on hug content. and as i extend my width you'd realize that the container will also change its size now if i select a vertical layout this entire icon will change to vertical spacing if i had multiple click me's and if i go to my frame and i switch from a fixed vertical height to a hug content height now i can see everything and as i scale you'll see that it is accommodating and i can also take it to a level where i can make it into negative spacing as well and this is very very useful when you're creating a stack of dps let's bring it back to zero now there's one more thing which is called as horizontal padding and vertical padding now let's understand what does that mean let's take this button again and let's assume that i'm not making a button but i'm making a tag like a small label sort of a thing and what is a label if i were to show you a quick example uh right here this limited time only this is not a button this is actually a label so in that case i need very thin padding right i needed to be responsive i needed to be like real and you know accommodating but i wanted to be thin so you can actually select the vertical and bottom padding in one single shot so if i were to say make this 12 pixels the padding here is just 12 pixels so how do i see this padding i can hold the option key and click anywhere on the boundaries and it will tell me the spacing i can go here and make this also 12 but now you would be wondering that ansh you are changing the left and right padding all together what do we want to change the padding individually so you click on this button right here and you will have all the individual paddings one by one so you can just change the left padding you can just change the bottom padding and you can do these things individually as well what if you want to do it equally on all four sides if you hold the option key and just click on this icon right here then you see this icon right here it says all padding and right now it is saying 12 12 68 52 why is that there's a specific logic behind this numbering 12 12 68 52 basically means that this is 12 on top left this is 12 this is 68 and this is 52 so th these numbers are basically arranged in a clockwise manner if i take all of them and simply make this 12 then all the padding becomes equal but sometimes because you have a lot of line height in most cases you need to add extra padding on the left to make it visually equal so here i've made this into 24 and my vertical and bottom padding is 12 pixel So you know obviously if I were to take a quick example uh from the iOS design system if I go here and take this one right here you would realize that this is a mailbox and all of these items are in an auto layout now why do they need to be an auto layout if I delete any of these emails I want the rest to simply come on the top let's say I delete all of them I need all of them to stack amongst each other right Now imagine if this wasn't an auto layout let's take this threads and let's delete this auto layout if i were to delete any of these you would see empty space actually let me delete these two this is the kind of behavior that you will get so in this case right here i would ideally want all of these emails to just jump back to the top because they need to be in a row but because there's no auto layout there's nothing that the parent knows so i can take this thread and if i were to press shift a again it will again become an auto layout and then i can increase the spacing in between them i can also make it extremely negative as well 
Now I will be putting up this Figma file in my community as well. If you go to Figma community and search for Anjali for to spray out, there's nothing that the parent knows. So I can take this thread and if I were to press Shift A again, it will again become an auto layout. And then I can increase the spacing in between them. I can also make it extremely negative as well. Now I will be putting up this Figma file in my community as well. If you go to Figma community and search for Anshmara, you will be able to access this. But I would strongly recommend you to sort of practice, right? Because let's say this message bubble, this is also an auto layout because you can extend it to whatever height you want. But see this, if I were to select this message bubble right here, this is an auto layout. Then there's another auto layout inside of it. Then there's another auto layout for the bubble. And this is where we understand the entire concept of nested auto layouts, just how we did nested constraints. Here, these people are doing nested auto layouts. Now you would be saying that Ansh, this entire hello is such a small letter and we check out the bubble auto layout. This says hug contents. Then why is this not hugging uh, to hello? What is this extra space for? This happens when you have selected this icon right here. If I were to make it as to auto width, then my text width would shrink and then the bubble, the entire boundary would wrap around. So these are small, small things that you can take care of, right? And uh, if you were to look at say keyboard, right? This is a very, very important example. A keyboard is extremely responsive. But if I were to go inside my keyboard, you will realize that inside my buttons right here, these are all frames. They haven't made this into an auto layout. Now, why is that? Because nobody would ever delete F, right? They would never ever delete F. They know that this is a QWERTY keypad and this has to be in frames. That is why they're not using auto layout. So you need to be very, very smart in understanding when do I use auto layout and when do I use frame? And the basic logic behind this is that if you feel that the inner contents will change in width or in height and they will regularly change, then you should use an auto layout. But if you feel that there's going to be some rigidity to it, they're going to be static or the elements are not going to change themselves in terms of physical dimensions or in terms of number. In that case, it has to be a very, very basic frame. So before we move to module three, I have three frames in front of me. Okay. So assume that I am creating a website where I am selling courses. Okay. And I want to create the mobile version of it, app version of it, and the desktop version for it. Okay. And let me just show you how the constraints look like. Okay. Now this is technically an incorrect design, by the way, because if this was a native app, you would obviously have a bottom bar. And if this was open on Google Chrome, then you'll have a top bar. But you know, just for the sake of discussion, uh, assume that this is a native app. Okay. And I'll make this into a component. And I will stretch this so that you can just see uh, how the app sort of responds. Okay. So an iPhone can either be this much tall, this much tall, uh, the width can sort of expand. So you can see that all of these things are sort of working out together. Now, how have I achieved this? Let's take all of these elements one by one. Let's revise all of the constraints. Okay. This thing right here, this is an info box. Okay. Now this info box itself is also a frame and within the frame, all the elements inside are in auto layout. Now, why are they in auto layout? Because I might want to have a single line thing or a double line thing, but you can notice that all of these things are not getting responsive. Why? Because technically I should have taken this heading. Let's delete all of these things and then taken this auto layout and this, and then put them together in auto layout as well. So that if I were to duplicate, it would have been very, very responsive. Now this is nested framing because I've added constraints to this. And then on top of that, this entire info box has its own left and right constraint. So everything inside of it is in the center. But when I talk about info box, it is at left and right. Then we look at the promo button right here. Now I don't necessarily want the promo button to stretch to left and right. So I will keep it at center. I don't want even the middle image to go, you know, scale itself. So I would probably put it in center as well. But what would happen if I were to make this into scale? This is exactly what would happen. It would sort of clash and it would scale according to the percentage, but I don't want that. So let me keep this in center as well. Then what I've done is I've basically created a rectangle at the back where I've put the same image poster, a gradient, and then I think there's one more layer on top of it. 
right? So there's a gradient layer uh, from the bottom and then you have a scrim. This is called a scrim, like a blanket, like a dark blanket, but at like a 50, 60% opacity. And this entire thing is at left and right. So as I move away, you can obviously see that this works. But now obviously after a specific width, you'd have to enter iPad, right? Like no iPhone looks like this. So at that point, I will switch to adaptive design and see what is happening right here. Check this out, check this out. This is very, very important. Why did this happen? Because my nested constraints are messed up. So let's see what is happening right here. If I were to go to my cellular connection and uh, these things right here, you would realize that it says scale, okay? Now I can't make any changes to this because this is an instance, so let me detach it, okay? I will go to cellular connection, select all of these, okay? First of all, make them normal. This is how they would look normally and see what is happening right here. See the behavior because they're at scale. So they feel that if my uh, mobile width is expanding, then I, I also need to sort of expand in width. So I should probably make this into right because they don't need to scale. They just have to stick to the right side. I will take this again and put this on left and now they are working uh, flawlessly, right? So this is how the behavior would work in. Now, folks, the important thing to note is that amongst iPad, you have responsiveness. But once I go from phone to iPad, it will be a separate set of components. So even in this case, you have the image which is left to right and top to bottom. Why? So that as I expand, it sort of follows around, right? And then you have all of these things which are, are towards the right side because I want them to be tied to the right side. So the image is also left and right. This is also image right. That is why, you know, the distance sort of remains the same. And then you have your desktop. So the elements remain the same, but you know, at one point this would sort of break. So maybe we will add uh, one more break point. So this is called a break point where you say that, you know, maybe I don't want the same design. Maybe at some point it should just uh, be different. So yeah, I just want to quickly uh, go through how constraints would have been added for all of these three screens. Uh, some important things to note, we've already covered that you will need different components for different devices. But when you're designing for a web, please make sure you start with the smallest canvas. You have to start with a width of 1280 pixels. When it comes to iOS, please make sure you start from uh, iPhone 8 probably because, you know, it's just very, very simple to go from a smaller canvas to a big canvas when it comes to responsiveness, but going from a big canvas to a small canvas becomes very, very tough. So I usually test my web designs on 1280 uh, 1440 and 1920 and beyond 1920 I don't do anything which is responsive I literally just put like white spaces on left and right and that is what I would recommend you uh, to do as well so with that we finally come to module number three where I just want to like show off some very very cool plugins and the first plugin that I want to show off is called responsify now there are two plugins that I want to show first one I will show it in front of you but eventually you will have to check out the second plugin on your own because I want you to do some homework as well so folks the thing is that in this case you can obviously like check out the constraints and all of these things but what if I want one single frame uh, being tested towards multiple sizes. So right now, manually, if I had to check how this would look on the MacBook Pro, how it would look on uh, a desktop, all of these things, I would have to sort of duplicate it and then stretch it one by one, right? But with Responsify, you all you need to do is go to this icon right here, go to plugins and just type the word Responsify and you will find it right here. Uh, as soon as you install it, you do command slash and type responsify and then they have all of these different devices as soon as i click on say desktop what it would do is it would test my entire design for a generic desktop for a macbook for a macbook pro for a surface book and for an imac and you can do this for phones as well so let's just say i take this frame out here and run the responsify plugin again and probably go and do it for android it would show me how the same pixel size would sort of get messed up if I were to make this on Google Pixel and Pixel XL. Now there's another concept right here that we need to understand and that is of independent pixels versus dependent pixels, uh, you know, which is the concept of SP and DP, but we will not cover that in this course because this course is not a UX design course, this is a Figma course. So I, will, I won't get into those details, 
but it's just a very very powerful plugin and what i would recommend you to do is to install the untitled ui you know file or any file from figma community and like you know start playing around you know how they have created all of these things in some cases you will find instances so you can detach those instances and there's one very very important video that you have to check out on figma's youtube channel it's called quick responsive workflows and trust me when i say this we had actually created a video back then this is around like two and a half years ago on this plugin called responsify or no responsify is what we did right now i think it was called responsive plugin and that allowed you to simulate multiple devices like it could actually allow you to have adaptive design inside figma because right now in a figma frame you can do responsiveness very easily but with these plugins you can do adaptiveness that is as you stretch from this frame to this frame it would automatically switch from the mobile design to the web design to the tablet design and so forth like crazy powerful stuff and so this is in your homework once you do it you will just go crazy now there are uh, some specific things that i want to discuss one is that this is a normal frame right but now figma has also introduced this thing called as a section and what is a section i can literally create a boundary like this and let's just say i keep these designs right here okay and you know when you are creating designs in a design team some designs are work in progress while some designs are ready to be developed so if you click on the section they have this small icon right here if you mark this then it will be ready for dev so when your developers come to this file they will instantly know that in this section are all the final figma files so it's just a way to you know sort of quickly uh do a handoff if you have limited pages you can organize your files using sections so now you have one more layer of organization you have sections within sections you have frames then within frames you have all of your components right another very important thing that i want to introduce is that when you are designing folks please make a component that looks like this so i call it as <laughs> It's not a problem. कोई देखे ना देखे देखो मैं भी काफी सारी चीजों से शर्माता हूँ बट डोंट नो वन नोज यू पर्सनली सो इट्स नॉट अ प्रॉब्लम एज एन हेड अ कंपोनेंट वेर यू हैव अ सब टेक्सट एंड अ हेडलाइन so basically what i do is any time i'm creating my files or i'm creating like inspiration i organize all of my research right so if you were to see all of our redesign files all of our a uh, redesign videos on youtube you would realize that ansh keeps everything very very organized so this is also a frame right it has constraints so you can always have it in different colors you know maybe white for research black for prototyping so you can make one component and then you know change the colors one by one just make sure that it is accessible i make have it very very all of our, nice all of my research right so if you were to see all of our redesign files all of our a uh, redesign videos on youtube you would realize that ansh keeps everything very very organized so this is also a frame right it has constraints so you can always have it in different colors you know maybe white for research black for prototyping so you can make one component and then you know change the colors one by one just make sure that it is accessible and you know it's just very very helpful so i just wanted to introduce you to this practice i had also written a medium article if you go to medium and type ansh mehra there i've written an article that says how to organize your figma files using headers i would strongly recommend you to do that and uh, hold space bar for bypassing this we've already done that if i were to randomly sort of stretch then the constraints would follow but if i were to hold the command key it would just bypass the constraints also if you're sharing your design files instead of going to the url you can select any frame and do command l and it would directly come uh, to the top url and then you can just do you know command c though you don't have to go to share and copy link and do all of that just do command l and command c and boom you are done right uh, there's also the outline mode so if you press command y you will enter an outline mode and then you can see every single frame and auto layout sort of mapped out right because look at the difference if i am not in my outline mode everything looks like it's in a single layer but once i enter outline mode then you can see that this is an auto layout this is an auto layout you know there's auto layouts within auto layouts so you can genuinely see the structure nested framing i've already done i would recommend you to create an annotation card for yourself so what is an annotation card it is essentially like this comment card which has a dynamic height so width i keep it static uh, what's up miss two streams where are we at well this is day 2 ka kaam aur 6 uh, minutes baki hai then we will go to the day 3
but then have your dp have your name and then what you can do is you can have different colors for this uh, one can be for feedback one can be for comments one can be for an important note because i'm not a very big fan of figma comments in general i really like when you know me and my team are brainstorming using these annotation cards and uh, they will really really help you so these are the two components that i would strongly recommend you to make them on your own of course i will be releasing this on the figma community as well so you can always copy the same components but you know you will not really learn uh, if you just start copying things blindly now while you are pursuing this figma course you will need a lot of inspiration for ui and web design as you practice so you know i won't waste time going through all of these urls i've literally just compiled all of my top rated inspiration websites right here uh, so you can just take a screenshot and go through them one by one i have also shortlisted four links that you can use to learn figma on your own in case you don't want to wait for our videos and you want to do these upskilling more detailed upskilling more advanced upskilling then not in the market and they have sort of you know curated all of these shortcuts one by one so it's crazy the amount of time you can save if you use these resources properly in fact folks if you're here for the first time we have created so many courses so there's a lot in ui ux events first sort of set the time something to do the recommend you for ux on the sub the resources that you see will be in the description please don't expect consistent and use out of this i hope that you saw the first episode as well please make sure that you're gonna learn case study goes on right or you homework for the next 5 days and i will be waiting for your homework i will be waiting for your stories on linkedin post to see how many people are actually documenting their learnings first of all let me know in the comment section what libraries in the next let me uh, you let what is so our students reading you please make through at least any three of these homeworks and uh, yeah no not sleep and upskilling some are go through at least three ui resources and try to recreate something i think now you have some understanding of you know figma in general and you would have obviously been upskilling yourself so just explore any three of these and i'm telling you you will find a lot of inspiration and document your learnings on linkedin and tag me i would love to see your notes i would love to see that you guys are actually making use of these homeworks and uh, yes coming back to our syllabus we are done with the first two lectures and in lecture number 3 we will cover style so library information have covered but i have the bond for all you know Body. This is your dost Ansh Mehra signing out. Finally, we are done. Now, three lecture number three. So we have done the two. Took a lot of time. Welcome to Foundations for Figma, our most in-depth Figma course for beginners. Today we will learn the basics of design tokens, styles, and libraries inside Figma. My name is Ansh Mehra, and I teach students design and AI. This is lecture three of our ten lecture free series. So without wasting any further time, let's get started. All right, welcome to lecture three of Foundations of Figma. Super excited! We've already covered lecture one and lecture two. In lecture one, we did the basics of Figma from scratch. In lecture two, we dig really, really deep into how frames and auto layouts work. Today, in lecture, इससे पहले कि मैं तुमको continue करवाऊँ, मैं क्या सोच रहा हूँ कि मैं ना इसके link तुमको पहले ही provide कर लूँगा, जिससे क्या होगा तुम लोगों को दिक्कत नहीं होगी। यही बात है ना? इससे तुम लोगों को दिक्कत नहीं होगी चाहे कोई कितना भी पूछे डायरेक्टली यहाँ पे डाल देते हैं एक सेकेंड में आई एम लर्निंग फ्रॉम ओके तो डायरेक्टली अब तुम यहाँ से क्लिक करके भी देख सकते हो अगर कुछ मिस कर दिया तो तो अब तुमको दिक्कत नहीं होगी Lecture three, we will be covering styles and libraries. I personally feel that now we're finally moving to topics that give you a glimpse of what Figma really is, why it is so powerful. By the way, this is going to be a ten lecture course, and you will find a lot of more resources around UX design, specifically for designers who are applying for jobs or writing their case studies on LearnUIUX.in. This is where we have our premium offerings, information about our meetups, events, mentorship, and a lot more. But this course is a Figma course; it's available for free. 
So let's check out today's syllabus. It is split into three modules. In module number one, I will cover the basics of this very interesting concept called design tokens and then styles inside Figma and we'll understand uh, why do Sir, I don't understand anything. I'm still watching. Look, now I prefer to see that just see. You'll understand it slowly. You'll start with So, I don't understand anything. This is not my first time. Well, तुमको कहां तक आता है हैप्पी भाई अगर तुम बताओगे तो मैं भी मैं हेल्प कर पाऊं कि हां यहां से हम शुरू कर सकते हैं तुमको कहां तक आता है <laughs> अभी तो मैं हम सिर्फ वीडियोस देख रहे हैं सीखने के कई सारे तरीके होते हैं जिसमें से एक होता है खुद करके करना एक होता है देख के करना एक होता है सुन के सीखना एक होता है आ, फील करके सीखना जैसे फील करके हम क्या सीखते हैं कराटे हो गया गिटार हो गया नो सर आप पढ़ाएं अरे मैं पढ़ा नहीं रहा मैं देख रहा हूं <laughs> मैं पढ़ाऊंगा तब लाइक uh, ये एक बार खत्म हो जाए अपना सीरीज खत्म हो जाए उसके बाद हम शुरू करेंगे खुद का बनाना सीरीज कब खत्म होगी पता है अभी तीन है और चार दिन लगेंगे इसको खत्म होने के लिए उसके बाद हम शुरू कर पाएंगे नहीं और चार दिन नहीं है उसके बाद ये फिर बाकी है <laughs> तो ये सब के बाद ही और ये सब चाहूं तो मैं अकेले भी देख सकता हूं बट मैं प्रेफर करूंगा सबके साथ देखने लिए क्योंकि किसी का भी कुछ क्वेश्चंस होता है तो वो पूछ सकता है वहां पे ये वाला सिर्फ फिग्मा है फिग्मा सीखने के लिए ये वाला डिजाइन सिस्टम है तो ये चीजें अलग है जैसे कि डिक्लेअर करना जैसे उसने बताया ना कलर्स आप डिक्लेअर करते हो तो वो चीजें अब कलर डिक्लेअर करने का फायदा क्या बताता हूं देखो जैसे कि अब ये हेडिंग होगी ठीक है ये सब हेडिंग है एक छोटी सी अब ये सबकी कलर एक ही जैसी होगी अब ये एक-एक को आप चेंज ना करके एक कलर डिक्लेअर कर देंगे तो क्या होगा सपोज इस का कलर हमने डिक्लेअर कर दिया कि ऑरेंज 1 है सबको सेम कलर दे दिए जो डिक्लेअर किए थे ऑरेंज 1 ऑरेंज 1 ऑरेंज 1 ऑरेंज 1 अब अगर आपको ये कलर अच्छा नहीं लग रहा है तो इंडिविजुअली आप इसको चेंज थोड़ी करोगे इसका अलग से फिर चेंज करो इसका अलग से चेंज करो इसका अलग से चेंज करो उसको एक साथ चेंज करने के लिए हम जो ऑरेंज 1 कलर है उसको हम कुछ और कर लेंगे मे बी पर्पल तो ये अब सबका साथ में चेंज होगा पर्पल एक-एक को चेंज करना नहीं पड़ेगा तो इसलिए डिक्लेरेशन का फायदा होता है जो कि इसमें बताएगा इस वाले वीडियो में फिर वैसे टाइपोग्राफी का अब सपोज आपने यहां पे एक फॉन्ट यूज किया है सेम फॉन्ट यहां पे भी यूज किया है अब आपको सब का फॉन्ट चेंज करना हो तो आप अलग-अलग करके चेंज ना करो सबको एक साथ चेंज करना है तो यहां से करते हैं टाइपोग्राफी वाला पे वैसे यूआई टाइप डिक्लेरेशन स्पेस सबके बीच की स्पेसिंग उसने डिक्लेअर की जैसे यहां पे देख पा रहे हो इतनी-इतनी स्पेसिंग है उसको अलग से ना करें करके उसने स्पेस के बारे में बताया है बटन सिस्टम अब ये बटन्स है उसको फिर अलग से ना करना करें करके एक साथ करेंगे कैसे उसके बारे में बताया है और ये हमको हेल्प नहीं करेगा ये हमारे साथ-साथ डेवलपर्स को भी हेल्प करेगा जो कि प्रोग्राम करते हैं मतलब कोडिंग करते हैं अगर तुम इसके कोड्स देखना चाहते हो तो ये होती है कोडिंग्स अब ये इतना इजी नहीं है जो भी बंदा करेगा वो परेशान हो जाएगा अगर सबको एक-एक अलग-अलग करना हो तो इसलिए वो भी डिक्लेअर करके यूज करते हैं अब वो डिक्लेअर कैसे करेंगे जैसे कि इसके अंदर मुझे इतना आईडिया नहीं बट ये देखो ये जो कलर देख पा रहे हो ना ये होता है डिक्लेरेशन वाला जैसे ये ऑरेंज को देख रखा है जैसे मैंने बताया था ऑरेंज दिया है अगर ये हम चेंज करते हैं आई डोंट नो चेंज होगा कि नहीं होगा होता है क्या नहीं होता है मुझसे तो नहीं बताया यहां पे कैसे चेंज करते हैं बट सपोज अगर ये चेंज होता है ठीक है तो यहां पे सबका साथ में चेंज होगा जितने भी ऑरेंज वाले कलर है सबका साथ में चेंज होगा कैसे एडिट करते हैं इसको एडिट हो सकता है भाई चेंज तो कर सकते हैं ओहो हो हो चेंज हो सकता है देखते हैं कुछ और डाल के देखते हैं ठीक है uh, एक गायम किया मैंने वहां पे 9 डालता हूं देखो अब इसका कलर चेंज हुआ और इसका भी कलर चेंज हुआ अब इसको यहां पे ब्लैक कर दूंगा तो इसको ब्लैक करना देखोगे सबका साथ में चेंज होगा ब्लैक लुक एट दिस मैं सबको साथ में ब्लैक करूंगा मैंने ये आज तक कभी ट्राई नहीं किया है बट ओके okay, अब हो रहा है सबको ब्लैक होगा साथ में लुक एट दिस एक दो एक दो एक दो एक दो सॉरी वाइट कर दिया यार ब्लैक करना था लॉल वाइट कर दिया सबका साथ में वाइट हो गया उसको हम ये कर लेते हैं ब्लैक कर लेते हैं नहीं तो रेड कर लेते हैं देखो सबका साथ में रेड हो रहा है ना कुछ भी कलर आप करोगे सबका साथ में होगा देख सकते हो सबका साथ में ग्रीन हो गया तो वही चीजें वो कैसे करते हैं वो सिखा रहे हैं लाइक प्रॉपर्ली कैसे करते हैं जिससे डेवलपर्स को हेल्प हो या फिर जो भी पर्सन है उसको हेल्प हो तो अगर हम एक-एक चीजें देखेंगे तो हमको समझ आएगा कि कैसे डालते हैं जिससे सामने वाले पर्सन को प्रॉब्लम ना हो 
तो कंटिन्यू कर लेते हैं इस वाले वीडियो पे थर्ड वाले पे स्टाइल्स एंड लाइब्रेरीज ये सर ये मैंने किया था एक बार वही चीज़ है लेट्स कंटिन्यू जहाँ पे थे वहाँ पे चलते हैं इसको बंद करते हैं एंड ओके ये वाली Welcome to Foundations for Figma, our most in-depth Figma course for beginners. Today we will learn the basics of design tokens, styles, and libraries inside Figma. My name is Ansh Mehra, and I teach students design and further. We covered lecture dig covering styles of the attend specific taught in membership. Let's check out today's syllabus. It is split into three modules. In module number one, I will cover. the basics of this very interesting concept called design tokens and then styles inside figma and we'll understand why do we even need them in module number 2 we'll study a real design system by uber and we'll figure out how big companies design and in module number 3 i will show you how do you declare text styles how do you declare color styles inside figma how is the practical implementation when you're actually designing an app now throughout this entire tutorial if i hover over something you'll see the zoomed in cursor on the top right corner you will see if i have pressed any key so there is absolutely no ambiguity left so let's start with module number 1 where we understand the basics of tokens and designs So folks the thing is that when you are creating an application you of course have your basic shapes which is rectangles ellipses and lines but you need to put some color to it right a ui will look really really bad if you don't have color in it but when we talk about colors your entire ui screen is actually made up of at least three buckets of colors even when you see this screen right now right even when you are watching this video on youtube you would realize that you have some very very basic grays you know it could be like light gray dark gray the text is also either black or gray but then there are some areas where you can see bright colors right for example here in figma you can see this blue color right here this blue color right here or uh, this selected panel even on youtube you can see the red color here and there so they are in a different category the grays that create the surface are in a different category and then sometimes when there's an error state when you delete something or when there's an alert or when there's a warning even then you have a different set of colors so in reality if i had to split a color bank of a ui i would split it into three buckets the first one are my grays so basically if i were to show you any time you create an application you basically need at least your basic grays which can start from black and yahan pe likha if need directly jump to module 2 let's skip and watch ki kya kya cheeze zarurat hai theek hai ye to aap kar hi loge then slow import app creating start from as i can because mobin is a very cool website it's a very relaxing design okay and let's just go to mobin because mobin is a very cool website it's a very reliable website that okay if i were to go and type ui design okay and let's just go to mobin because mobin is a very cool website it's a very reliable website that i keep using for inspiration right so this has a bunch of screens right here so let's just say i go to this one right here so this is by luma right this is for hosting events now if i open any of these screens let's just open say this one oh okay so you notice that you have all of these grays right here but then in some cases you have this green color tag as well you have these icons as well right and you often need very very subtle shades of gray specifically if you're working in light theme now if i were to select any application which is probably say in dark theme let's check out something which is in dark theme mm -mm -mm. yeah this one so tesla is essentially a dark theme app right so when you enter here you'd realize that you have of course your blacks but then you have sat are anubhav bhai namaskar <laughs> we are on learning phase total dark shades of gray as well now very interesting thing to note here that is that in a dark theme as the surface comes near you it becomes lighter in shade because there's a very important dark theme principle in user interface design and it says that right in front of the screen there is an assumed source of light so for example if i were to take a look at this thing right here this color is darker whereas this color is lighter why because this is on top of the surface so anything that comes closer to me will be in lighter shade that is why you would notice that input fields are usually darker why because they are on the inside 
in this case this card is on the top this card is again on top of this card that is why it gets lighter and lighter as you move towards the screen now something very different happens when we switch to the light theme in light theme you'd realize that you don't have something which is pitch pitch dark but usually in a lot of ui designs they keep either a simple white color for example in here they have simple white color stuck on the uh, <laughs> top <laughs> is light an assumed source of light so for example if i were to take a look at this thing right here this color is darker whereas this color is lighter why because this is on top of the surface so anything that comes closer to me will be in lighter shade that is why you'd notice that input fields are usually darker why because they are on the inside in this case this card is on the top this card is again on top of this card that is why it gets light तो जो जो हम यूज कर रहे हैं या फिर जो चीज आगे बढ़ रही है आगे स्क्रीन के पास आ रही है वो लाइट हो जाता है गॉट इट अ लॉट ऑफ यूआई डिजाइंस दे कीप आइदर अ सिंपल व्हाइट कलर फॉर एग्जांपल इन हियर दे हैव सिंपल व्हाइट कलर स्टक ऑन द टॉप फोल्ड एंड देन दे विल पुट लाइक अ वेरी ग्रे लाइक अ शेड ऑफ व्हाइट लाइक अ डार्कर शेड ऑफ व्हाइट एट द बैक बट द अंडरलाइंग प्रिंसिपल स्टिल रिमेंस द सेम सो हियर वी हैव लाइट कलर्स एंड लाइट शेड्स इन डार्क थीम वी हैड वेरी वेरी डार्क शेड्स but the principle remains the same because see how this white card is on a brighter node so the surface is gray but the card is white but again if i were to put down all of these colors in different brackets the surface colors come in a separate bracket these brand primary colors come in a separate bracket and if you were to see any of the delete buttons or any of the alert buttons they will come in a separate category altogether so i can't see them right now uh, but yeah for example this is like a success one right so This is not a brand color this is not a surface color it's a different category altogether and these are called semantics now of course i keep saying this again and again that this is not a ux design course this is actually a figma course so we won't go too deep into understanding what are these grays and brand colors and semantic colors we've already created a 15 episode course which was for free on ux design there i have a video called declaring your ui palette so there i explain this in detail but just to make sure everybody is on the same page on this specific topic first we declare our gray so let's just assume that we have a light themed app right and i'll start from scratch okay so i will create a box and let me make this as white now you can't see this because obviously it's in front of a white surface now i will make a copy of this and i have two ways to make this gray either i can hold the shift key and press the down arrow so it creates a nudge amount so it automatically creates a gray and i can duplicate and i can actually go and press command d again and again and this is not the exact way to do this i am just doing this so that you know it's easier to understand it's quick but i will just press down arrow again okay maybe here i'll press another down arrow again uh just to make sure that we have something darker so i can copy this hex code and you know paste this here and it completely depends on you as to how many shades do you want right in most cases i usually recommend people to take their entire gray palette and split it into three parts okay when it comes to grays if you are working for a light theme then first comes your base colors so these are colors that are very close to the color white because we are working in your light theme then we have some mid colors that are actually sort of moving towards the gray shade so i'll keep these as my bases and maybe these three as my mid colors so what i can do is i can probably go and make this even darker then let's delete this let's duplicate this and make this even more darker so they will come in my mid category now i will also need the colors that are very very contrasting to white so this time let me just go and select pitch black okay let me keep this at the very end of the spectrum and i will create two copies and this time let me just increase the brightness like this Let's copy this hex code, paste it right here, and then increase it again. So just make sure that this color and this color are not like too too uh, similar. But yes, now I can take these up. Let's tidy them up. Let's take these, tidy them up as well. So these ones right here become my base colors. Inside grays, by the way. These become my mid colors. and these become my contrast colors and now you would say that range there are three of them so 
how do you differentiate in between the three bases so it would be base 1 base 2 base 3 mid 1 mid 2 mid 3 contrast 1 contrast 2 contrast 3 right so this is how you can do that now when it comes to brand colors brand colors are not usually decided by the ux designer they are usually decided by a brand designer so let's say in mcdonald's the brand colors are maybe yellow and red for facebook they are blue and white right so there's always one primary color and then one accent color so maybe in facebook's case blue color is the brand primary and white is the accent color so you need those brand colors specifically when you're making buttons so let me show you a real example let's come back to mobin let's find something in the education section so if i were to go to duolingo you would realize that duolingo has a very bright like a green happy uh, sunshine color as their brand primary color but when i go into the app uh, let's just say i come and probably go to the next flow let's see if i were to check out say this one right here right so now you have some of the brand colors but you also have a bit of grays right so my grays come in this category the stroke of this message uh, the text right here the text right here but then you also have some brand colors that are filling the key phrases and all of these things right so brand colors are usually decided uh, by your marketing designer but if you don't have somebody on your startup then you probably have to end up uh, you know deciding the brand colors and in that case uh, you can then you have semantics which are people put in. When it comes to grays you have bases mids and contrast but for brand colors there's no base mid. then i make another copy boy let's just say that this is my brand primary okay of these e5 that is why i've said yellow one i can have yellow two yellow three just how i had here right i had base one base two base three right so even here i can have yellow one yellow two yellow three so this entire concept of giving a new name to a very complicated number this is basically called abstraction so what is abstraction when you're driving a car and when you change your gears for you you're just changing a gear and sort of moving it forward and backward but in reality when you're shifting that gear a lot of things are changing inside the car but you are not aware of it because the designer of the car has done abstraction he has made sure that every technicality is just hidden and you just have one point of control which is the gear in this case i am using the value yellow one and i'm using it as an abstraction to make sure that i don't have to regularly say this complicated word again and again now the fancy word would be that i am using an alias alias means an alternate name for the same root value another important thing here to know is that at one point i might be using yellow one for different use cases so of course i have a hex code this hex code i'm just calling it as yellow one but maybe yellow one is being used in some other icon in some other place it's being used as a success notification in some other place it's being used for a verification icon like the same yellow one is being used in other other places so you have more branches of the same color and this entire thing is possible only because of this abstraction now i know this will take some time please spend this half an hour this one hour with me i'll take at least one hour to make you understand how these tokens work and you know throughout this process in the middle you'll be like i didn't get what he said i know it happened to me as well so i need you to listen and give me time and i will explain you how this works because i have tons of examples to make this clear to you right now we'll just keep things to a single level okay we have 7f whatever and i'm calling this as yellow one let's assume that this yellow one is now a token for me so this alias name this alternate name this yellow one is now a token that redirects me to this hex value now right now this example is showing you me giving a simple name to this color but you can have tokens for type styles or type sizes of even the spacings or the borders basically anything that you need to define and make it into a rule so that nobody can just come and you know change yellow one let's just say if i don't have these tokens and some other designer is working on any screen and he's using the same icon that requires yellow one if this yellow one is not defined he will have to use the uh, eye dropper eye picker tool to sort of choose the yellow color and probably he might just sort of make a mistake or something like that but if i define a rule that if you're using this success icon you can only use yellow one 
then he has to use that token. Now moving forward, if I say that instead of yellow one, all of these tick signs will have yellow two, then I will have to make change in just one single part. And if I make change in that one single part, it will be reflected in every other place where yellow one was used. So this is basically you building a very, very robust system. Now you can also do this for shadows and a lot of stuff, right? But typically when it comes to color styles today, we will just figure out how do we tokenize colors. Okay. And it's just a, a way to give easy to read names to hex codes. Now let's go a level deeper and understand that when I name this color as say yellow 100, because this is a very common convention, yellow 100 can be used in different ways, right? It can be used as a text or an icon. So then what happens is that when a company is being built, you make a set of colors, which are your hex codes. Then you give names to those hex codes, but then as a designer or as a marketing designer, the marketing team is also taking out colors from that same bank. No matter what team you're in, all these different teams come to this one single yellow 100 and then they might take yellow 100 and then use it in their own individual system. So mobile team is using its own system with yellow 100. This iPad team is using its own. So what happens is that you start with root value, then you give it a global name. In this case, it is yellow 100. But then we have the system name or the alias name. In this case, maybe I call it as semantic alert. Maybe I'm building a web app and inside my web app, I am using this inside the semantic alert icon, like whatever it is, it is in a component on my web app. Then I can dig deeper and say that even within a specific pop-up, I am using the same color in the icon fill as well, specifically in the alert icon fill as well. So when it comes to a specific component, you can create more layers. It's like layering of the names, but they all redirect to this one single color. So you can have as many levels as you want, right? But in most design systems, they just keep it to three levels. Like they have a normal name and then the normal name has an alias. And people just say that this is either an alias or a component specific, like it depends on you. And I will show you the examples. It'll become very, very clear to you. But the thing is that in reality, the token names are not that simple. So right now I've sort of made that, okay, yellow hundred is now called alert icon fill. I have just simplified it to a very dumb level. In reality, the token names are pretty complicated. And I will explain you how to name those tokens as well, but just bear with me slowly, slowly. We will cover this. A very important thing to understand is that colors can have multiple levels of layering, but when it comes to shadows or when it comes to even like glowing effects, or when it comes to other styles, whether it's type styles or spacing there, you will not have so many layers in most design systems. When it comes to say font sizes, they'll just have eight, 12 and 16, eight will be called small. 12 will be called medium and maybe 16 will be called large. And that is where they stop, right? People don't really say that small then becomes mobile heading, uh, medium then becomes web heading. Like they don't do that. In most cases, people just keep it on a single level. It is only in the colors where people have multiple levels of hierarchy, multiple levels of, you know, tiers. Now let me give you a practical example. Let's take this prompt right here, which is like a plan choosing app. And by the way, this is from a free open source, uh, Figma community file called untitled UI. In this case, you have a root value, which is the color blue. Now I can give it a global name, which is blue 100. Then after blue 100 is established, I can say that this comes under my primary brand color. Okay. So I will put it in my UI category. Imagine that the marketing team is also using this global name, ka, uh, entire palette. The web team is also working and the marketing team, everybody's using blue 100 for their own individual use cases. But right now I am in the product team. The product team is building a UI within the UI. We have named this as primary one. Okay. Now, once it has been named as primary one, I also decided that this. Sir, kab tak padayenge? Well, sir, 21 minutes hue hain. Usko aur jana hai 15 minutes. To maan lo ki 11 something ho jaega yaar. 11:30, 11:40 tak ho jaega. Main pura nahi dekhne wala kyunki. काफी सारी चीजें मेरे को मेरे को भी चीजें समझ नहीं आती बट हम देख रहे हैं समझने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं तो अभी मैं बता देता हूं इसमें हो क्या रहा है ये इसने एक बनाया है कंपोनेंट उसके अंदर वो कलर डिक्लेअर कर रहा है हर एक चीज के लिए एंड वो कैसे कलर यूज हो रहा है वो बता रहा है एंड कैसे लोग यूज करते हैं चाहे वो कुछ भी कह ले वो सब कलर एक ही तरफ से आ रहे हैं एंड एक ही चीज से आ रहे हैं रूट वैल्यूज का ये है और चाहे वो डिक्लेअर कर ले 
वो जैसे जिस जिस चीज़ों के यूज़ कर रहा है उसके हिसाब से वहाँ पे अलग कलर्स हो जा रहे हैं सेम प्राइमरी वन माइट बी यूज फॉर दिस चेक आइकन राइट हियर एंड ऑल्सो फॉर द मोडाल टेक्स्ट सो इन दिस केस ब्लू वन हंड्रेड इज फर्स्ट रेफरेंस एज यू आई प्राइमरी वन एंड देन यू आई प्राइमरी वन इज देन अगेन लिंक्ड टू द चेक आइकन एंड द मोडाल टेक्सट सो दीज टू विल बी कंपोनेंट स्पेसिफिक टोकन नेम्स बट दिस थिंग राइट हियर दिस इज गोन बी अस्टम स्पेसिफिक टोकन नेम नॉट दिस सिस्टम स्पेसिफिक कंपोनेंट स्पेसिफिक दीज आर नॉट रूल्स This is just my way of organizing. People might call this as you know not component specific, but instance specific. Some people instead of a uh, system specific, they will call it as device specific. Whatever it is, it is just dependent on how you want to organize them. But the benefit of this is that maybe say one year down the line, I decide that modal text is going to be black. In that case, I can just break this branch right here and connect it to some other alias name, and it will work out very very well. Now. If you've understood something so far, I know that a lot of this is complicated. You will have some clarity, but your if. Okay. अब मुझे समझ आया कि benefit क्या है जैसे मैंने बताया ना कि like तुम उसका अलग करके बाद में कर सकते हो जैसे हम पीछे बता रहे थे इन सब चीजों में तो एक बार में सबका color change नहीं होगा जैसे अब इसका color change नहीं हुआ था जब हमने इसका color change किया था तो वो फायदा है कि अगर हम इस orange one को हर जगह साथ में ना रखें अलग अलग कर दें जैसे इस icon के लिए orange one अलग है orange one button वैसे ही ऑरेंज वन टेक्स्ट ऐसे करके अलग कर सकते हैं तो जब हमको चेंज करना हो तो सिर्फ यही चेंज होगा ये चेंज नहीं होगा ये फायदे हैं इफ यू आर एंजॉइंग एंड इफ यू रियली रियली फाइंडिंग दिस यूजफुल डोंट फॉरगेट टू क्लिक ऑन सब्सक्राइब एंड हिट द बेल आइकन नाउ लेट्स टेक अन अदर एग्जाम्पल ऑन द लेफ्ट वी हैव अ वेब ड्रॉप डाउन कंपोनेंट एंड ऑन द राइट वी हैव अ वेब साइड बार हियर इफ यू नोटिस दर इज अ हावर स्टेट ओके दिस थिंग राइट हियर वी हैव अ हावर स्टेट फॉर दिस ग्रेस so this would be a token name this but please note real token names don't look like this so let's understand how do you name these tokens and to be honest there is no one way for it let me just uh, break this down to you there are many many ways people have all of these different kinds of use cases so it really depends on how complicated you can be right and i usually keep things very very simple so i'll show you some simple ways as well i'll show you how big companies do it as well so right here Uh, I have a bunch of components. Okay, this is a label. These are three buttons. This is a toggle. All of them use the same color. Okay. Now, what you need to do is when you are creating token names in your startup or when you are just building out, building, you know, your design system, you need. Oh, data khatam hone wala hai. Tabi puch raha tha. Well, kafi bada yar. <laughs> Video aur itni bachi hui hai. बची हुई है काफी बची हुई है वेल well, देखते हैं मैं भी और इलेवन थर्टी तक करते हैं फिर पॉज कर लेंगे क्योंकि उसके बाद बाकी चीजें भी हैं जो कि करनी है ठीक है इलेवन थर्टी तक करते हैं उसके बाद कर देंगे एंड कर देंगे नीड टू मेक श्योर दैट योर टोकन नेम्स आर द शॉर्टेस्ट एंड द सिंपलेस्ट एंड यू कैन ऑलवेज टेक रेफरेंस फ्रॉम अदर सिस्टम एज वेल सो आई विल पेस्ट अ लिंक ऑफ एटलीस्ट फाइव टू सिक्स रिसोर्सेज where you can learn from design systems and uh, you can actually learn this is the token name firstly most importantly tells you the use case it tells you that whether this token name is for a color or for a type style or for a shadow or for a space and i'll show you examples i'm just kal jab shuru karenge dekho jab shuru karenge main kya karunga main soch raha hu ki like baki cheeze main aadha dekh lu and tumko ek bar main short karke bata dunga ki kya seekha better rahega या फिर जब हम एक्चुअल में यूज करेंगे तब मैं तुमको बता दूंगा कि कैसे करना है क्योंकि इसने काफी लंबी वीडियोस रखी हैं इससे तुम्हारा टाइम बच जाएगा तुम्हारा डेटा नहीं जाएगा ये एक बेनिफिट होगा या फिर हम कल यहीं से शुरू करेंगे जहां पे पॉज किया था जैसे आज हमने किया कल का जहां पे पॉज किया था आज हमने खत्म किया लेटिंग यू नो एज टू वॉट ऑल द टोकन नेम शुड कन्वे सो द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग इज अ पर्पज एज टू वॉट इज दिस कैटेगरी फॉर second could be a property when you you know whether this is a background fill or whether this is just a stroke you know stuff like that and then sometimes you can go very component specific as well you can say that even though this is a color token even though within a color token this is a background fill this is a background fill for just a button this is the background fill for just a radio button so you go very component specific as well but when it comes to components you can also have states so right here i have three buttons okay the same color here it is being used for surface here it is being used for the text okay here it is also being used for text 
so you can also say that within the button what state but hey what is difficult thing is here ki jo jis tarike se industry level bata raha hai na bhai kuch zyada hi deep hai maine jahan tak use kiya hai figma itna industrial level maine bhi nahi dekha tha is in that button is it in the default state or the hover state or the disable state and now it is absolutely not necessary to use all of these things i'm just learning you know as to how people try these out so let's take an example we have this alert button right here okay this would be my root value which is the actual hex code then i give the hex code a global name which would be blue 100 and now for this specific fill i will not assign blue 100 to this i will first create another token call it ui because this is for the ui library then pill which is my component then primary which is the state of the pill because this pill has another primary secondary tertiary variant inside the primary pill this is only used for the background when i create this token now i will have this as my token color and this would be linked to this fill now one very very important thing to note is that i have used dashes and not slash please don't use slash because it will end up complicating a lot of your code now if i were to do the same for my buttons now this is the same button but now this button has two different states the color is the same so root value is 75 i will create as a back color and no brief about tokens is because you need to know why you need to learn styles and style concept is pretty simple. and this is the password so let's start this i always recommend people to study uber's design system and it's called base so if you go to base.uber.com you will have access to their entire library on the left they have this thing called as design tokens and if you click on usage you can actually understand how they have built their design tokens and what was their logic behind it now i will not cover everything or uh, you will have to even watch this video at least two times and you will have to go through their website as well uh, and if it gets कल डेटा बचा के रखूंगा और एक और कल एक काम है आपसे पूछना है मेरे सो जा मेरे सर मैं सोने जा रहा हूँ ओके कल एक काम से आपसे पूछना ठीक है कुछ दिक्कत नहीं कल आप पूछ सकते हैं कुछ दिक्कत नहीं है गुड नाइट हम इसको ख़त्म करेंगे एंड ट्राई करते हैं कि कितना देर चलता है और आधा घंटा बाकी है बाय सर एंड माई नेम इज़ लक्की हैप्पी हैकिंग लक्की ओके आई विल रिमेंबर lucky it's confusing don't quit because that is what most students do they just quit if they feel like oh this is kind of getting complicated ta raha hai jaise complicated hota hai log chhod dete hain to chhodna nahi hai tumko seekhna hai jab tak samajhna hai tab tak dekhna hai ya fir jab tak seekhna hai samajhne ki koshish karna hai okay good night kal milte hain kuch problem nahi hai aap aaram se kar sakte ho kabhi bhi seekh sakte ho yaar you have so much time ओके देन गुड नाइट आराम से कल देखना या फिर कल करते हैं शुरू कुछ प्रॉब्लम नहीं हम इसके बाद भी बहुत सारी चीजें करने वाले हैं रुकने नहीं वाले हैं स्टिक विद इट वॉच दिस वीडियो ऑल्सो वन मोर टाइम एंड इट स्टार्ट मेकिंग सेंस फॉर यू बट लेट मी शो यू हाउ ऊबर हैज बिल्ड देयर डिजाइन टोकन सो बेसिकली दे हैव एक्सप्लेन द फैक्ट दैट यू नो वेदर इट्स अ कलर वेदर इट्स अ स्पेसिंग वैल्यू और अ टेक्स साइज वट एवर इट इज यू विल हैव अ नेम एंड यू विल हैव अ वैल्यू Okay you remember in that case we had the value was a hex code and you had a name even in this example this is my value and this is my name now for a token to work a name is required the value is required but in a lot of cases if you want to say that uh, do i have to put the type inside the token name do i have to type the word color or text when i'm naming the token not necessarily so this is still optional and you also have an option to add descriptions when you're creating these components and styles inside figma so these are also optional in engineering they don't say name and value they have another lingo they call it as key and value so let's just say that you have this color right here this would be my value but key would be button primary and they would call it as dollar sign button dash primary we don't use the dollar sign inside figma but when developers use it they use key value so in design we have names for every value in engineering it's just the same as having a key for every value now why the word key because this key is unique you cannot have two keys with the same name so that is why they've sort of called it as key because every key is unique right so in engineering uh, they've used this word because you can't say have the word primitives dot blue dot 600 as a key that has different values this one single key will be connected to a singular value now 
as i said tokens can be used for many many things so in uber they use tokens for eight supported types they use it for colors typography layout grids dimensions corner radii haptics like a lot of stuff in today's session because we are covering styles majorly styles are useful for your colors and typography and shadows and even in that today we will mostly focus on understanding color tokens because those are the ones that slightly become confusing because you have multiple layers uh, but of course when we talk about key and value this value can't just be a hex code it can be a string it can be a boolean value which is true or false it can also be a number or an integer it could be anything right so today we are just covering colors but when you go through this website you realize that oh there's a lot for each and every type now the interesting part is that let's say i go inside the color section and inside colors i have a bunch of tokens right so what they do is for every single token you have a token name each token name basically has two components okay in these two components component number 1 is where you tell the type of this token as to where is this token going to be used now if i give you a quick example of this colors but those is dot blue dot 600 as a key that has different values this one single key will be connected to a singular value now as i said tokens can be used for many many things so in uber they use tokens for eight supported types they use it for colors typography layout grids dimensions corner radii haptics like a lot of stuff in today's session because we are covering styles majorly styles are useful for your colors and typography and shadows and even in that today we will mostly focus on understanding color tokens because those are the ones that slightly become confusing because you have multiple layers uh, but of course when we talk about key and value this value can't just be a hex code it can be a string it can be a boolean value which is true or false it can also be a number or an integer it could be anything right so today we are just covering colors but when you go through this website you realize that oh there's a lot for each and every type now the interesting part is that let's say i go inside the color section and inside colors i have a bunch of tokens right so what they do is for every single token you have a token name each token name basically has two components okay in these two components component number 1 is where you tell the type of this token as to where is this token going to be used now if i give you a quick example right here you have the color black so this is my global token now this black is now referenced as content primary and border selected now when i say the word content for them content means text okay so if i'm using this as text they are basically saying that we are using black color for primary text but we are also using the color black for a border when it is selected then again within content primary they are referencing the same token as secondary button content and input value text so they are saying that when we create an input box when you type something inside that input box when you add the text that also is pitch black when you have a secondary button and you know mostly secondary buttons are green color so the text in the middle it would be black now if you look at all of this differentiation you would see that there are three zones this is zone 1 you see this gray line this is zone 2 this is zone 3 this would be called tier 1 this would be tier 2 this would be tier 3 this is where we are in the theme section but this is where we go component specific so inside uber's design system within only the color type you can have three tiers and we will discuss the naming for these three tiers as to how they have come up with this logic why is this called content primary why is this called secondary button content okay now this doesn't mean that the same rules will be applied for spacing or for typography or even they will have three tiers no only the color tokens will have three tiers also a lot of people say that three tiers mean the token name will have three parts no that does not mean this only has two parts it has the type and then it has the context okay so it is not necessary that three tiers mean that the name will have three parts not at all it's just that they have the option to jump from zone 1 to zone 2 to zone 3 and it basically means that the same color can be used across three levels that is why they they call it as three tiers now i'll show you how they have organized their color token types step number 1 they declared all of their primitives like literally 
they took a bunch of hex codes that they had shortlisted and they gave them global names okay and they have like more than 100 hex codes like they have a huge library of every single possible color that their teams can use okay now even the marketing team can only pick from this the product team can also only pick from this now from the primitives they have picked some specific colors that they call as foundation colors which has you know basically an alias for their brand color so these are their brand colors and it has only six values then they have the third bucket which is called core which are just their grays so you remember we have were declaring grays when we were making our three buckets uh, in this case they have four buckets right so they have primitives they have foundations which are so called the brand colors and here they have cores which are basically their grays and they have picked 17 values from this entire palette so i think it's mostly going to be from these light grays and then they also have extension so basically for the same bright foundational colors they have like these neutral versions as well and some semantic colors you know for error state for success state then they also have some overlays as well so these are called scrims or blankets so there are 29 values as well they have one more category called programs i'm not putting those here because it'll just confuse you but basically programs are colors that don't change as you go from light theme to dark theme so all of these colors right here they might switch uh, but in programs the colors don't change so it's just another bucket of colors but all of them are coming from my primitives now let me show you how uber defined their grace they said that of course the core is built from the primitives you know stuff like gray 100 gray 200 gray 600 this is like the meat and potatoes of the entire system and then they say that our grays are also split into three categories one is your background which are your surfaces then we have content which is your text right any text any icon that you have it comes on the content and then you have borders which are just the strokes around your surfaces so they've sort of split their grays all to into specific established i can say that this comes under my primary brand color okay which is your text right now here if i look at this component if you look closely literally any single component in uber's library can be broken down into atoms and this atom can only be one out of these three things it can either be a background or content or border so your icons and text they all come under content but the surface comes under background here my heart and this chevron this becomes content the background is pretty straightforward in this case all the text inside content this label is content the icon is content the border is black and then this is the background and of course i think uh, you get the drill right even in this case the minus plus all the text layers become my content and when i say content it means that they can only pick from these colors right here these tokens right here and where did we get these tokens from we got them from this big bank so a single color is being referenced across tiers right and you remember what i was saying this thing right here this component layer this is the kind of colors that we would have added right so when you have input value text it basically means that input the value text it is a content is it a background no right is it a border no so your first decision was to first decide that whether this color is being used in my backgrounds or in my borders or in my content when i'm taking this decision i am actually asking myself that okay i jumped from this state to this state but now within this state i need to check what what kind of color i'm choosing am i going to do something which is around designing the background or content or border then within a content right here you can see that you have different kinds of content right you have the label text and you have the icon so even though the color is identical even though the color is absolutely white it is the same color but my token name is going to be different so here it would be probably like input text primary here it would be like icon fill primary right so hope this is making sense and hope you're sort of able to understand uh, why do we need to sort of create this abstraction right now as i said a token can fall into three tiers and let's say your color token name will have your color type and your tier when we were creating these rules right root value global name alias name component specific name even uber has done something very specific in my example i had created four layers uber only keeps it to three layers so i said that as a root value and from my root value i called it as a global name they say that this global name is actually the primitive token so instead of using the word global name they call it as primitive token so if i were to make the system i would call black as the global name 
Uber is calling it as a primitive token. Then the global name, once it has been attached to the primitive token, there is an alias to that primitive token as well. So the same thing goes and becomes this and they are calling it as a semantic token. So I was calling it as alias. And then at the very end, the semantic tokens can then become component specific tokens. So of course, it is just like different names, but the underlying concept is the same. Now, just to make sure that we revise all of these things and just to make sure that there's absolute full clarity, when I look at a token name, the token name tells me two very, very important things. First of all, it tells me the type, whether it's color, size or a stroke. And then the tier tells me the context and the state at which the component is. Now, the more narrow the intended use case, the more precise the naming. For example, when I take this example, this thing is not a very narrow use case, right? But this is like a very, very narrow use case, like a very specific, like it's for, for the secondary button within the secondary button, it is in the content. So the token name becomes longer and longer. So as you go from tier one to tier two, to tier three, to tier four, the naming becomes more and more complicated. And by the way, they have these bunch of videos. Uber has created these videos and they call it as screencasts. They will tell you a lot about how this entire thing works, right? So uh, they have this very simple diagram where they say that the hex is accessed by a primitive name. This is the primitive name. And then the primitive is then accessed by the token name, which is content accent. So, you know, in a lot of design system articles and a lot of token articles, you will see this formula that token equals name plus value. People think that name plus value means you take the name, you take the value, you stitch it together, it becomes your token name. No, no, no. They are saying this is just logically, this is what they're trying to tell you. This is not a formula for writing your name. They are just saying that maybe content accent is one name, which is, which is linked to the value blue 600. Then blue 600 becomes another name, which is again linked to the value of the hex code. So that is how, when we were sort of discussing in the very, very beginning, right? We had this topic right here, where we said that in design, we have names and value, right? We had names and value here. In this case, what they've done is the name is primitive and the value is the hex code. So hope this made sense. Now the question is, how do you finally declare these? How do you declare these levels of abstraction inside Figma? Unfortunately, styles only allow you to go from hex code to the global name. So you can't really have global name being converted to the alias or alias being converted to a component specific token. And that is a limitation. And that is why Figma has introduced this new topic called variables. So variables allow you to create a root value and then link the root value to a global name. Then the global name is linked to an alias, alias is linked to a component and blah, blah, blah. For a very long time, people in the design world, what they were trying to do is they would create different global names for the same color. So you, they would choose the color black, declare it as text primary, also declare it as contrast one and blah, blah, blah. And it would just become very cluttered because you would have so many style names all linked to the same color. And if you had to change the color in one single spot, you had to go to individual styles one by one because there's only one layer. Uh, but you know, even now color styles are still pretty, pretty useful. And before you understand how variables work, I think it's very, very important. You understand how color styles work, right? So let's understand that. How do we really create these color styles and type styles? And how do you declare them inside Figma? So let's start with module number three, where we actually understand how do you declare your color styles and type styles. Now, folks, just to remind you again, this is not a design system course. This is a Figma course. So I will just show you how do you save your color styles, but we will not get into the details of what kind of colors do you need to establish for that? My 15 episode course is good enough because if you finish the color styles, I explained here, you can not only use them for your UI, but you can also use them for your social media. So at this point, styles really help me to create better carousals and better stories for my social media because in social media you just have like one layer of like naming right and uh, what you can do is that once you save a specific color let's just say that i create this color right here and i just call it say let's pick like a subtle red all you have to do is click on these four icons right here and this is where you can have access to all of your styles now you would be seeing that i have some styles here and then i have like this weird title and a bunch of names here as well. So the thing is, this is the concept of libraries and we will cover that in a while. Assume that I have five different Figma files and in the first file, I have declared all of my main colors, 
my primitives, my cores, whatever it is. But now in my file number two, I am making the mobile app. In file number three, maybe I'm making the website. I want file number two and file number three to access my colors from the first file. So to share all of your styles from one file to another, you need libraries. So what I've done here, let's just say that if I select this color, click on these four dots right here and go to this plus button right here. I will have a new window where it asks me, do I need to save this as a style or a variable? Now we haven't covered variable yet. So I will just click on style here. I can give this a name. We've covered the naming in detail in our 15 episode course. It's called declaring your UI palette. But just to give you a very, very simple principle, you can just do something as simple as say, if these are your grays, then you do gray slash, then base one, base two, base three. If it is your brand, you do brand slash X, Y, Z, right? If it is a semantics, so I can do sem slash and I can do alert one, right? And then you can also add a description, which would be visible to your designers. If you click on this icon right here, you can choose in between all of these colors, the alpha levels. In fact, you can also save your gradients. You can also save image fills and you can also save the same for videos. So I will simply click on create a new style and now I will have it saved right here. The benefit of the slash convention is that once I click outside and if I see all of my local styles here, so local style means that all styles declared in this specific Figma files, you'd see my text styles. I will show you how to declare these and you will see your color styles like this. Because I had named the style as sem slash alert one, semantic slash alert one, it is now part of a group. So if I declare another color, which is sem slash article two, I will again have it in that similar group. Now let me just get rid of all of these styles. I can simply select delete style and delete all of these one by one. And let me show you how I would establish my grays, right? So we had created these grays, right? Let's take these rectangles, bring them out. Now there are two things you need to learn very, very carefully to declare your color styles quickly. One is that once they are arranged in order, you need to make sure that you use the sorter plugin. And we had tried this out in our video two as well, where I showed you how important it is to make sure that your layers panel ordering and your actual canvas ordering is identical. Once I have sorted them, I will do command slash again and go and click on rename selection. So this is called batch renaming. And here I will make this as gray and just slash. Okay. Now what happens is that all of these are now called gray slash. Now I will select the first four, which are just my base again, go and click on rename selection. Now the fun part is that I want something to add on top of gray slash. So I can simply select current name and to select color name, it just puts dollar and the Amberson sign, which is the and sign. Now, if I type say unch, then you'll see in the left side preview, this is how my naming would look like, but I don't want it to call lunch. I want it to call base. So I will make this as base dash, and then I want numbers. So if I want ascending numbers, I will click on this. If I want descending numbers, I will click on this. If I do ascending, then it will add two small ends with a dollar sign. So it will come as base zero one, base zero two, base zero three. If I delete one of these ends, It'll just keep it as base one, base two, base three, base four. And I want the ascending to start from one. Once I do that, you'd realize that this becomes my base one. This becomes my base two, this base three and this base four. And this is exactly what I wanted. I can do the same for the mid ones as well. I can go rename selection, do and, and then do mid and then dash and then dollar sign and N. I can choose these. Again, command slash rename selection dollar sign and and do contrast dash dollar sign N. So what happens is that once I select all of them, they all have the prefix of gray slash, but the second part is mid one, mid two, mid one, mid three. Now this is where you can save a lot of time. You need to install the styler plugin. And by the way, to install any of these plugins, you just need to go here, click on plugins and just type the word styler and just install that plugin, right? So you can just make sure that you have this plugin valid. I have installed it already. So I will select all of these command slash 
type generate styles now what figma will do is that it will take all of these layer names and then use these as my style names as soon as i click on generate styles instead of going for every single color and you know for example if i were to create this by going here clicking on plus typing this name and doing this so many times with the styler plugin i have all of my styles saved in just a second and they are all neatly organized in my grays now of course i can go here double click on this and call this as grays as well and then you can do the same for your brand colors your semantic colors and so on so it's very very useful uh, if you take this shortcut and this is how you know color styles are sort of declared inside figma now if you were making it for a dark theme or a light theme then you would have had light as your semantic and they're all with the styler plugin i have all of my styles saved in just a second and they're all neatly organized in my grays now of course i can go here double click on this and call this as grays as well and then you can do the same for your brand colors your semantic colors and so on so it's very very useful uh, if you take this shortcut and this is how you know color styles are sort of declared inside figma now if you were making it for a dark theme or a light theme then you would have had light ui slash gray slash blah 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 dark ui slash gray blah 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 but once we start using variables i will actually teach you how this one symbol bank of colors these one uh, set of colors these are the ones that will be referenced in your light theme the same ones will be referenced in your dark theme so you will just have a bunch of primitives the same subset will be used for light theme the same subset would be used for dark theme because in the earlier days you would have to create a separate set of styles for light separate set of styles for dark but now with variables you can do the multi level thing but we will not cover that today because i just want to make sure that this video is just about telling you how these styles are sort of created right so i would totally recommend you to check out our detailed video which was on ui styles coming to the typography styles first of all when it comes to choosing the right type faces i would totally recommend you that if you're using even for your marketing or for your ui please make sure that you only stick with google fonts right and in terms of google fonts you know there's so many websites that give you font recommendations but the most important part about google fonts is that they have a lot of filters and you always get open source fonts like they make sure that you have license to use these fonts and they are easy to load they are prefetched inside figma so you don't have to locally you know install them in your laptop or your designers don't need to install them in their laptops and you know in typography there's a very very important topic of pixels versus ms versus rems which again we have really really went into details of how those work in our video which is titled basics of ui typography it is in the 15 episode course i would totally recommend you to watch that video after you finish this one now when it comes to type styles let's just say that i want to save this type style i want to fix this font figma only saves these properties right here but they will not save the color so if i save this type style as a heading style it will not save the color it will only save the font size the line height and all of these things right so these are the properties that it saves and it's very very simple you just have to click on these four dots click on this plus icon again and then name the type style right now the question is that how many type styles do you save and how exactly do you break these down so i told you that in your colors you had your grays your semantics and all of these colors but what happens in a type style so first of all one very important rule you never go below 12 pixels 12 pixels is the smallest size and there's no rule for increments for example the first one can be 12 the second one can be 14 16 the main point is that you should have options that are limited but also visually very distinct from each other for example there's very very insignificant difference between 12 pixels and 13 pixels so i would just keep it at 12 14 16 18 24 and your mobile app will have a different type system your web app will have a different type system this is a very very common mistake that students make that they feel that uh, a single type scale will fit for all of their devices it doesn't work that way so what happens is that you majorly have like three categories of type styles okay one is your label text so label text is you know single line text the second category is your display and display is just like a alias name for headings so like for big font sizes you have displays for single line text you have labels and then you have paragraphs right so let's just say that i want to declare my labels right 
uh, I will start from my 12 pixels and by the way, let me just detach all of the styles. I was just trying this out before teaching you folks. So I will just delete all of these styles and I will go to label five. This is at 12 pixels. And when it comes to labels, because I know that this is going to be a single line text, the line height has to be 100%. It should not have any extra spaces. I personally use internet minus 2% line spa letter spacing, but it completely depends on you. And paragraph spacing has to be zero and it has to be on auto width. So I will choose 12, I will choose 14 and 16 and 18 and then 24. Now, exactly how we did with colors, I'm going to do something very similar right here. So I'm going to take these out of the auto layout, take these and now I'm going to rename them. Let's just say that they have a random name by default. Okay. So my first responsibility is to make sure that I select what category of type this is. Is this a paragraph or a display or a label, right? So I will probably go and make this as label slash. Okay. Now the thing is when you're choosing the names, you need to make sure that you, for you as a designer, you can instantly figure out whether this is a uh, regular or bold or what size this is for. And there's also one very common convention. The biggest size always has the lower number. So I could have named this as L1, L2, L3, L4, which is label one, label two, label three, label four. But the bigger size gets the shortest number. So basically 12th pixel one would be called label five and the biggest one would be called label one. But I can't have this as my style name. So what I would do is I would keep it very concise. I will have label one as my group name, but within labels group, this is how I will rename them. I will call this as L and then because I probably want these in a different uh, numbers, I will probably have dollar N. So now it'll be L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. Okay. Then I can press dash and then I can do reg which stands for regular because this is my weight and I want to see it visually as well as in the type style because it's sometimes it becomes very tough to sort of see visually. But if you see reg, then you instantly know that this is reg. Now a very important thing to note here is that when you designers say the word regular, developers actually signify this in forms of numbers. So for them, it's not regular, but it's actually a weight of the font. In most cases, you can find the number by going to Google fonts. In this case, regular is going to be 400 for me. So I can name this as regular 400. And when I click on rename, you'd realize that label five has a layer name, which is now L5 reg 400. Now the benefit of this is that I can duplicate these items, go to say this one label five, make this bold, make this bold again. Let's make this one bold as well. And now this is no longer reg 400. Now this is probably say bold 600 because they usually have increments of 100 right so if this is 400 this is 500 this is 600 this is 700 so it's going to be 700 now instead of renaming them from scratch i can do command r and here in my match i can type reg 400 now it'll replace reg 400 with whatever i type here so i will write bold 700 and rename them and now i have this and this. Now the fun part is that I completely forgot to add the word label before this. So I can again do command R and let's just make sure that they're sorted properly, right? So let's run the sorter plugin before I rename them. So let's do sort position. I will select all of them, rename selection, and then just write the word label slash current name. So now whatever the names that they have already, I'm just adding a prefix to the same name. So I will simply click on rename. And now I have all of my styles ready. I will go to my styler and generate styles. As soon as I do that, you'd realize that I have all of my text labels right here. Now the fun part is that you can either keep them in a single group or you can use the slash convention and put uh, you know, all the L5s together or maybe all the regular text together. So, you know, there are many, many ways that you can group these out. I just wanted to show you how do you use sorter and layer naming in Styler to declare these quickly. 
But for individual understanding of how do you declare these type cells, you should 100% check out the video that we had on the 15 episode course. Right now, when it comes to displays, of course, you have bigger font sizes, you can keep a 135% line height. But when it comes to paragraphs, 100% you need to have at least 135% of the font sizes. Now, there's a huge difference here. I don't want you to write 135% here. I want you to calculate 135% of this and then add the line height. Make it into a proper integer value and keep it very, very explicit because I've noticed that it uh, usually ends up in a lot of complications when you use like exact 135% as the percentage sign. So make sure that you calculate numerical values and of course you can have them as paragraph P7, P6, P5 and it would just work out. And in most cases I recommend to have just two weights regular and bold like it usually works pretty well. Now there are three Figma plugins that are extremely useful. I would not implement them right now because they're just very straightforward. You will love them. One is find and replace. So sometimes you have to swap words across your Figma page and maybe they're not into a component. You have to individually fix those spellings one by one. So this works exactly how find and replace works in Notepad and uh, you know Microsoft Word. Uh, but now it's inside Figma as well. Then you also have Ghost UX Writer. So they give you a lot of good dummy copy that you can add to your text, whether it's for error states or login errors or, you know, confirmations and all those things. And then we also have spell with three L's at the end, which is like a spell check for Figma because I keep seeing so many students uh, make very silly spelling mistakes because they just don't do spell check. Now, as I said, once you have declared your styles, you can go to your assets panel and click on this book icon right here. And when you click on publish, all of your 27 components, components are basically those buttons and uh, things that we have saved, right? You remember in lecture two, we had created that diamond sign where you had one button component. You can save all of these components and declare styles in this file and then publish this as a library. So for example, in this specific file that I'm showing you right now, I have included libraries of other Figma files. So there are colors that I regularly use. There are icons that I regularly use. So I've added them here. So they are all visible. All I need to do is add to file. Now I can click on this publish icon and then it'll show me that, okay, these are the type styles that you want to declare. As soon as I click on publish, it takes around one or two minutes, depending on how many components and styles you have. But once done, if you have a pro plan, you need a pro plan for the syncing of these libraries. If you have the pro plan, then now you can declare styles in one part and then access them in another. And this is how it practically works even in real design systems, right? So you have one file where you just declare your core components and your design system and your colors, and then you publish a library of that. And then whatever app or any website or any project that you make that happens in a separate Figma file and you enable this core design system library in your mobile Figma file, in your web Figma file. And you know, that is how you sort of keep things organized. So a very, very useful use case for beginners would be that if you go to Figma community and you install or duplicate the box icons file, it is better to publish a library of the box icons file and then use that library inside your working file. A lot of people, they copy the box icons and they paste them inside their Figma file. And you know, it's just not a very modular way of doing things. So it is always better that you keep all of your assets organized in separate, separate libraries so that you can enable them one by one. Now, before I leave, I want to give you some resources for inspiration. I keep sharing them in all of my videos, not going to go through them one by one, but all of these websites will really, really help you take a lot of inspiration for UI and web design. Then here are four websites that can help you learn Figma even though I am uploading these videos if you want to feel that you want to do more you will have to do more by the way and this is not for UX design this is for learning Figma these four websites are really really cool also we had upload episode 2 but I felt like a lot of people didn't finish the episode 2 so please make sure that you're catching up on the syllabus and you're regularly telling me in the feedback section as to what is it that you would want me to cover I would really really appreciate if you could just click on subscribe and hit the bell icon and like this video because it really helps us or tell YouTube that the content is really helpful. Now that I have introduced you a glimpse of design systems, a glimpse of tokens, I would totally, totally recommend you to check out design systems repo.com. So it's and very, very detailed. So if I go here and click on design systems, you will have a bunch of design systems that you can learn from. For example, if I go to say Audi UI, I can actually see the design systems that are used in real Audi cars. 
right so i can go here and read how they have organized uh, for different viewports and for different screen sizes so it's really really inspiring to see how these big big brands use design systems properly like you can also check out carbon by ibm another very very inspiring design system and as i said once you go here inside your guidelines and inside your component section you will see how they have organized every single thing so within components you can see how they have made their buttons right so if i were to double click on this i think i have to just click on this accept all let me click on buttons and you can see that they have full documentation they show their primary secondary tertiary danger buttons it will really really teach you a lot and the fun part is that they also have like live demo so you can see the states that they interact with right you have all of these components like very very detailed documentation for students right nothing is going to be theoretical once you make notes of what i have taught you and once you go through these resources right so one is design systems repo.com the other one is design systems for figma.com where you can actually get the figma files for all of these design systems so when we go to a website like carbon or any of these online websites right this is still documentation but on design systems for figma i can actually let's just say if i had to check out base right which is by uber i can click on the figma kit icon and it will take me to the exact figma community page of uber where i can get the official figma file so you can imagine how valuable this is is for a person who really really wants to get deep into ux right and you don't have to do this one by one i would 100% just remind you that we have crossed the 15 episodes in months i know your four months i personally feel that just to learn figma properly just to learn the basics of ux the basics of ux psychology you need at least 6 to 8 months of practice where you're spending 2 to 1 and a half hours every single day after spending 2 to 1 and a half hours every single day it'll take you 8 months to become good enough for cracking a good high paying internship and if you're stuck at your ux case studies we've made a dedicated video on writing your first ux you it's 5 days you need to make sure that you cover these things right so firstly i know that a lot of stuff that we discussed in tokens it might have intimidated you slightly but the complex topics are uh, you know they're supposed to take time like you have to give them time you have to read more you have to watch content and you have to watch content again and again so it takes time it is simple but it's not that easy right and i would recommend you to of course finish our color and type declaration and button declaration video from the 15 episode course of course i made those videos like 2 years ago uh but i would totally recommend you to watch them they will still clear out a lot of your basics and make detailed notes on notion if you don't know how notion works i have created a very very detailed various design system by shopify or even base by uber because these guys have documented things really really well and complete time basic we have covered the first three lectures lecture number 4 is going to be on components and variants again very very useful feature i can't wait to sort of finish all the 10 lectures because once you've done these 10 lectures we'll obviously move on to a lot of more exciting stuff which is dedicated towards ux and spatial design and ux psychology in general if you're here for the first time make sure you click on subscribe and hit engineering how to prompt okay finally the next video is about basic components welcome to founding of this Okay. This is again hundred ten. Welcome to the one hour ten. Again one hour. Mm. Learn variable like a pro. So just six lecture, right? The lecture lecture is me. So six, five, so seven. Okay. So this is the last one. Welcome to Foundations of Figma. Our forty-eight. Welcome to the fifty-eight. Welcome to the one hour. Welcome to. Okay. So four more to go.
these videos i don't think these are needed for me uh yeah irctc have some upcoming bookings and some extra features as well and then at the bottom you have an option to i think type or maybe just speak about your query and in the upcoming videos we will also be taking care of to be honest when you're designing for your own brand or when you're designing for i've used box icons and remix icons because both are open source so i can use them for commercial purposes and then a very big change was to make sure that instead of these icons i actually give space for a subtext because as a newcomer i would not even know what to expect under file tdr or i would not know what is change boarding because i am not a regular traveler so it's very important to have space for a subtext and even here notice how the top line is in semi bold and the bottom line is in regular and instead of having just a simple icon I've put the primary color from the IRCTC's logo. So I took this logo and I chose two colors, this one and this one. So I declared them in my palette as IRCTC Primary One and IRCTC Primary Two. So the colors sort of reflect a bit of their brand. This is really good. Let me watch these. Hmm. A lot of things are there. Okay. So that's it for today. Let's meet tomorrow.